So was he wrong? Yes, I believe he was. But do I throw him out of the kingdom for it? No, no, I don't. What's up, truth? This is Ben, and today I want to take a biblical look at slavery. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm responding to a man by the name of Tyler Lee Conway on Twitter. Me and him had a Twitter exchange, and I mentioned uh, eventually in the conversation that I was just going to make a video because Twitter is so limited in its scope because there's a character limit, and you can only say so much, and it's just it it, it ends up being weird. And I I meant to make this video earlier. But I was waiting for this, my Blue Yeti mic. This is the first time I'm using it, so I apologize if the audio levels aren't 100% uh, amazing. I got this because I had people complaining, because I was just using my onboard microphone that comes on my camera, and it was kind of didn't sound good, and it sounded low and whatnot, so I wanted to wait until I had a good microphone, uh, this one, to give it a try and see how it turns out. And I also wanted to talk about some of the things that we came across in our conversation. Now, I had tried to film it once or twice before, and I was just trying to go through the Twitter conversation and reply to everything he said and kind of give what I wanted to say. But it just, it didn't work out good. It didn't sound good. It just kind of, it seemed sloppy the way that it was coming together. So I wanted to instead uh, step back and look at a couple of the points he made and respond to those. Because I think it'll be more beneficial than walking through and trying to like recreate the conversation. It just sounded weird. So I want to talk about slavery. Uh, let's talk about a biblical view of slavery. And let's look at some of the arguments and some of the things he said. Now, the reason I uh, initially responded to him is because he posted a tweet and he said, My man of his time's arguments are cultural relativ relativism arguments. Meaning that when somebody's talking about a man of his time argument, right? You're, you say something like, that person is a man of his times. Which means that, yeah, he made mistakes. Yeah, he was sinful. But the time that he was living in was different than the time we're in now. There were different social norms, there were different understandings of scripture and the Bible and Greek and Hebrew and language and things of that nature. So when we say that he was or she was a man of their time, we're not giving them a free pass, but rather we're giving them grace to be fallen human beings, which we all are. And we understand that people have blind spots, and the blind spots they had back then are different than the blind spots we have now. We all have issues that we struggle with, and we all have areas that we think were sound biblically and theologically, but we end up falling short. And so that's why we use the ta the, the label Man of His Times. And uh, Mr. Conway just said that Man of His Times arguments are cultural relativism arguments. Well, I don't think they are, because what he seems to be saying is that when I say something like that, I'm applying that, well, he was a man of his times, meaning that the sins he did back then are okay because of the culture that was around him. So they think he gets a free pass, right? This person gets a free pass. They get to sin or engage in whatever aberrant behavior it is that they want because, you know, they're in that time, so they get a free pass. Well, that's not what I'm saying, and that's not what people are saying. What we're doing is we're saying, yeah, he was a man of his times, meaning the time period in which he lived, he had shortcomings, downfalls. Places that he or she may have fallen, you know, willfully or unwillfully short. And sometimes in small ways, sometimes in big ways of, you know, our biblical morals or our biblical laws or commandments. And so the way that we look at it, I think, is a little bit different. And we ended up getting into a discussion about slavery, specifically about Jonathan Edwards. And some of the things that um, he got into, I felt he was trying to project things onto Jonathan Edwards. Because I was arguing that Jonathan Edwards was a man of his time. Meaning that I believe Jonathan Edwards had shortcomings. Maybe blind spots. He did own slaves. Uh, he had six, maybe seven of them. And, um, yeah, let's get into some of the dialogue, the going back and forth. Now, the big issue uh, that I think here that he brought up is that he said in one of his tweets, The kind slave master argument is bad. And this is pretty much saying, and it seemed like he... Uh, met this or later as, as a, the conversation moved on that he believes there's no such thing as a kind slave master because in his mind when he thinks of slavery he thinks of 
18th and 19th century in America, right in the South, the slavery that occurred there. And what he's thinking of is extremely harsh, bitter, racial, segregated slavery with lynchings and beatings and the, the idea that, you know, African Americans, black people are just property. They can be traded, they can be ripped apart, things like that. So when he looks at slavery, in his mind, he has only and specifically that type of slavery. But the problem is that that isn't the only kind of slavery that has existed. Slavery has existed much longer uh, in many different contexts. We had, you know, Roman and Greek slavery. We had Old Testament slavery. We have New Testament slavery. We have the slavery in America in the 18th and 19th century. We have slavery in the West Indies. We have African slavery. We have slavery today in Muslim countries, right? Slavery is spans, you know, pretty much all of human history. And it has been different in different times and in different cultures. Slaves have been treated differently um, in the first century if you were a slave. For instance, in the Roman Empire, you had the ability to buy your way out of slavery, right? Once you hit 30 years old, you were able to um, acquire enough money in order to pay your way out of slavery, depending on, you know, why you were uh, in slavery in the first place. Um, and there was, you know, obviously every, every single instance is different. But he says there's such a thing as a kind slave master argument. And I disagree. I think there is a kind slave master argument. I believe that the argument can be found in scripture, actually. So let's look at some scripture. Let's look at Philemon, right? Because Philemon is specifically about slavery, and it's Paul writing to Philemon about his slave Onesimus. Now let's read what Paul has to say about this slave master. So this is Paul writing to Philemon, right? Now he is a master. He owns slaves, and Paul is writing to him on behalf of one of his slaves. And if we take the statement, the kind slave master argument is bad, and we apply it to this, then I think we have some contention. So let's just read in the beginning. Paul writing to Philemon says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, Timothy being with him, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. So he calls Philemon his beloved fellow worker. Verse 4, skip down. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now Paul is calling Philemon a slave owner, a master, his fellow worker, his beloved. He is, you know, overjoyed by the fact that he hears about his his faithfulness and you know he even says because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you so not only has paul been refreshed but the other saints other christians have been refreshed through him and it's just one instance in scripture where we see that a biblical and uh paralleling to that a christian understanding of slavery can be much different than what mr conway is proposing here or what we see from a lot of slave uh, owners in the 18th and 19th centuries. Is it possible for a Christian to be both a slave owner and a kind master? Yes, I think it is. And in this case, when we're talking about Jonathan Edwards, is that the case? Yes, I think it is. I think Jonathan Edwards owned slaves, though he even wrote a defense of it. But in his mind, I believe he was thinking of a biblical view of slavery, not a southern horrific beating, treating them like property kind of slavery. And we see this in Jonathan Edwards' own actions. Jonathan Edwards even allows uh, African Americans to join their church. One of them is saved through his preaching, through one of his crusades. Uh, there are Native Americans that are allowed to join his church. So Jonathan Edwards and the people in his congregation not only felt it was okay to allow slaves or minorities uh, to join their church, but they also were saved and became fellow brothers. So when you look at Jonathan Edwards and his view on slavery, I think that you could apply the kind slave master argument to him. He doesn't treat them like property because he lets them into the church and then he lets them get saved. Some of them get saved through his teaching and preaching and they become his fellow brothers and sisters. Now, does he still have slaves? Yes, he does. Was that right for him to do? No, I don't think it was. Given the time and the situation, I don't believe it would have been okay. I think it was sinful, but I don't berate the man and throw him out of the kingdom for what he did, because I believe it was a blind spot. But again, when we look at this and we apply the man of his times argument to him, I think he was looking at it in light of the biblical view of slavery. Right? He owned slaves, yes, but he treated them fairly. He treated them like his own brothers. He let them into the church. They were saved. So he considered them fellow heirs spiritually. 
just like you would anybody else. But they didn't have the freedoms of everybody else. So was it a blind spot? Yes, it was. Does he get a free pass? No, he doesn't. But was he being our horrific, bad, evil, belittling, teach, you know, treating them like property slave owner that we saw in some of the you know southern regions? I mean, some of the people just treated their slaves like they were nothing? No, that isn't the case. I don't see the evidence for that. And I see evidence from the scripture that we can have kind slave owners, that you can be a kind master, that you can do it in a Christian way, morally and otherwise. So this idea that there is no such thing as a kind slave owner or slave, slave master, that's not biblical and it's not historically supported. The idea that Jonathan Edwards was, you know, horrible, mean, vile, and treated his slaves like property, I don't see any evidence for that either. I see evidence to the contrary, actually. So was he wrong? Yes, I believe he was. But do I throw him out of the kingdom for it? No, no, I don't. And this is one reason I wanted to make this video, because... When I, my interactions with Mr. Conway, and I've watched him over several weeks now, and his the way he, he tweets and the way he speaks, and his theology and his foundations, and the, the kind of both political and religious holdings that, that he has. And um, it's very progressive, very liberal, both in the political and religious sense. And I hate to use the word woke, because it's just, it's so charged emotionally. To use that term but I, mr conway is in error i believe and i think he is allowing his emotions and some of his presuppositions to get in the way of his ability to think clearly and biblically about some of these things now obviously this has not been an extensive look at slavery or jonathan edwards or things like that you can go out and read edwards for yourself you can read some of his writings you can read what he did you can read what he said you can look at his church and the slaves that were there and the the ones that were allowed in and the ones that were saved. You, you can do your own research and come to your own conclusions. But one of the problems is when I see people arguing like this and I see a consistent pattern of thought and theological underpinnings, it, it leads me to believe that somebody like this cannot really have a, a firm grasp on Christianity because his it seems like his, his understanding of history is shaped by his present day political and religious progressive thinking and that was one of the reasons i made my initial tweet is because i said the irony is that mr conway is a man of his times right the the people in the future christians in the future will look back at mr conway and look at his you know his beholden ideology and his use, utilization of critical race theory right crt and they will judge him in the same way that he is judging Edwards. And I would hope that the people in the future would have the same grace for him and for me that we should have for Edwards and for others. And the idea that he doesn't see that his entire worldview is led by this critical race theory, and then that filter is used to look at everything in the world, not only scripture, but history and personalities and politics and things of that nature, it clouds his judgment and the judgment of others. They aren't able to have an objective view of Christianity and the outworkings and things that go along with that because they have put critical race theory at the start. They start with critical race theory. They start with victim mentality. They start with, you know, different people groups and separations and things like that and blaming other groups based on you know, skin color or political affiliation. And that's not a biblical way to look at the world. It's not a Christian way to look at the world. And that's not the way that Jesus looked at it, the way the apostles looked at it, the way the early church looked at it. And if you look at everything through that lens, it is going to be distorted. And I think that's what's happening here. So I hope that this video has helped at least flesh out a little bit. Now, we didn't, you know, get super in-depth. We could look at more scripture. We could look at history. But I hope this is a good starting point. And I wanted to, to make a video, like I said, because Twitter is just so unfitting for actual conversation. Twitter is good for posting links and, you know, giving people, you know, information up to date, quick information, which is fine. But for in-depth dialogue, it is wholly ill-prepared for something like this. So I hope this has helped. I'm going to post this. Hopefully uh, Mr. Conway and anybody else who sees this uh, can get into the conversation. And I hope we're able to have maybe a... Uh, 
conversations online, maybe some YouTube conversations, maybe people can make some reply videos, because I'm afraid that Twitter is just not gonna, gonna cut it. You can't gauge people's emotional state. You can't see nuance or cliche or you know facial animations. You just can't see it. It's, it's impossible to understand. It's so limited. So hopefully this will be a, a good starting point for us to have a conversation and maybe it'll lead into other things, you know, political, religious, or otherwise. And uh, let me know what you thought about the audio. I'm still playing with this new mic. Like I said, I just got it. And I'm using it to hopefully, um, you know, filter out some, some background noise. You'll be able to hear me better. Uh, let me know what you thought down in the comments down below about the mic and about this conversation. And hopefully we'll see you later, guys. Take care.